my name is Norwin Marins, and I'm representing the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs with our monthly FJMC webinar series. And uh, this morning, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, a cousin of mine, second cousin, Ben Marins, who's a 35-year veteran of uh, broadcast journalism. He spent 21 years as a popular talk show host in the uh, Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin area on the airwaves of Wisconsin Public Radio. Uh, today, he teaches storytelling, speaking, and listening skills at the corporate and collegiate level and spent two and a half years as the chief storyteller at the Blood Center of Wisconsin, Wisconsin's Blood Research Institute. Uh, he translated science into English and used story uh, use stories to help promote awareness and raise money for future blood science uh, research. Uh, his presentation to us this morning is the art and science of uh, Jewish uh, storytelling. Uh, ben is the author of uh, books on the topic of uh, listening and listening skill development. Uh, one is entitled People Are Dying to Be Heard and Unit Unitasking 25 Tips for Better Listening. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Ben Marins. Good morning. Thank you. You can all wave. If you want to keep yourself muted, that's a great idea. I'd love to see your faces, but if you haven't got your makeup on, that's okay. Um, hello, hello. Wave, wave. So greetings from Milwaukee where the, the sun is shining. It's a balmy 41 degrees. So we'll talk about stories. At one point, I am going to put you all to work, so you will need a pen or pencil and paper. Uh, you won't be writing a lot, but you will be writing. Uh, I call the first story, Today I Am a Man. Every Jewish kid says this, uh, Today I'm a Man or a Woman, on the day of our bar bat mitzvah. It is rarely true. On the Wednesday before my bar mitzvah, which uh, took place on November 4th of 1972, I was in the sanctuary with Meyer Schissler. Meyer Schissler was my Hebrew school teacher, he always wore a gray suit. He always wore, in the coldest of weather, he would have short sleeves on that gray suit. So when he took his jacket off, we'd see the numbers on his arm. We never asked. We just quietly knew, and he never said anything about it. On this particular Wednesday, I was pretty much butchering my Torah portion, and he stopped me. And he said, Benjamin, it's in God's hands now. And he walked out of the sanctuary, knowing that in three days, I was either going to learn Hebrew magically, uh, somehow, spiritual guidance, but I hadn't done the work I was supposed to do. So the bar mitzvah was a couple of days away, and I, I really had two goals. One was I didn't want to embarrass myself in front of my, my maternal grandfather. Uh, he led the satyrs, and he, he epitomized Judaism, and he was going to be there, and he'd know I didn't know my Hebrew. The other was I didn't want to be Gary Davis. Gary Davis was the kid three weeks before my bar mitzvah who got, like many of us, stuck. And he wanted to ask the rabbi for help. So he put his hand to the mic, and on the wrong side of the mic, he covered it, and he whispered into the mic, Rabbi, what's this word? And the whole sanctuary laughed out loud. And I didn't want to be Gary Davis. Well, I got through the bar mitzvah. I don't know how. I said the... The, I read the Hebrew, I, the blessings, the Torah. I gave the speech. I said, indeed, today I am a man. But frankly, November 5th, I was no more a man than I was on October 30th. But at some point, we become adults. So the question was, when would that happen for me? Because it really didn't happen at my bar mitzvah. A couple of years later, it was the spring break of my junior year in high school, and I was water skiing and Florida and I fell and I, I popped my, my L5 disc and I was a sneeze away from never being able to walk again. So I had surgery. I spent the summer in a body cast to my shoulders to my knees. And when I got out of bed in the fall to go back to school, I'd aged. I don't think I was still a man yet. So in uh, the spring of my senior year of high school, the next year, my grandfather is failing. He's got an emphysema. He was a camel non-filter smoker for way too many years, and it was taking his life away from him. 
Sunday afternoons, we would go to Graham and Grandpa's for the uh, afternoon deli tray and conversation. Well, this particular Sunday, my mom and her twin sister, my aunt, were there with their four kids and our three kids. And Grandpa was in the bedroom because he was too weak to come out of bed and see everyone. At the end of the summer, when I had my back surgery, my dad handed me a set of keys to a Firebird convertible. And I had incentive to get out of bed. So that Sunday we were visiting grandma and grandpa. I had my own car and I told my mom, I'm going to stay a little later because I want to spend some time with grandpa. We didn't say he was dying, but we kind of knew it. So everyone left and I went into the bedroom to sit with my grandfather. He was a, a titan of industry. He had a, a dressmaking business on the north side of Chicago on Elston Avenue. And he was just a tough guy uh, with everyone but his family. So I worked with, at the factory. I'd seen him be tough with other people, but never with grandma and never with his grandkids. And I'd seen love in his face. I'd seen fierceness in his face. I'd never seen fear until this afternoon when it was clear the oxygen tank that he was using to live had stopped working. And my grandmother didn't know what to do. And there was a phone number on the tank, so I called it. I got a machine that said that they'd call me back. And they were located in the southwest suburbs of Chicago. And we were on the North Shore of Chicago. So I knew this wasn't going to work. Something told me, you need to do more. So I ended up calling an oxygen supply house that was in Evanston, right next to Wilmette, where we were. And the operator answered the phone live 24-7. And she said, we'll have two people there in 15 minutes. Don't worry. 15 minutes later, two strapping young guys walk in with two huge oxygen tanks. And they showed us how to use them. And they said they both work. God forbid one didn't work. The other does work. God forbid both don't work. We'll be here within 10 minutes, any time of the day or night. And the fear I'd never seen before my grandfather's face went away. The two guys went away. And I noticed my grandmother was quietly crying in the corner. Tears of relief. So I gave my grandpa a big hug. And I gave my grandma a hug and I went out to my car to go home. I did have homework to do. But I stopped before I got in the car and I looked up to the sky. I said out loud, today I am a man. Because I know that the moment when I truly took on the responsibility of what it is to be an adult male Jew, to be someone who saw his responsibility, the tikkun olam, making the world a better place. You don't make the whole world a better place. You make individuals' lives better. And on that day, I had my second bar mitzvah. Our stories validate our journeys. That's why they're so critical. They, they validate what we've been through, and if you've made it 40, 50, 60 years or more, you've done some things right, no matter how much of a failure you may think you have been in your life. Fools don't make it to 60 and 70 years old. It's just, there's too many things that can get to us. How you got there, your story is critical for you, for your children, grandchildren, for the kids you come in touch with, for anyone who is struggling to try to find their way. And I believe that we have an obligation to do two things. One is to story gather. It's probably more important than storytelling. Story gathering means I'm gonna spend time giving you my time for your time and attention. And the other is that I'm gonna tell my stories. And I say, when you're looking for some guidance with that, Two ears, one mouth, listen twice as much as you speak. This applies to many things. But especially when you're telling stories, you get better at storytelling by gathering and taking stories and then sharing them. So understanding somebody's story to me is critical. So they have an obligation to tell you what's really important. And you have an obligation to hear it. I was teaching a listening skills course to a bunch of nurses. And at the heart of what I teach is that 
I can't give you more time with your patients, but I can make the time you have with those patients better for you and for them. It's getting to know who they are. It's hearing them. At the end of the seminar, a nurse came up to me. She had just started, uh, at the time of the story anyway, just started at a nursing home. And between shifts, they nurses sit with the managers and they talk about the people in the nursing home who got in, who possibly left, what problems have shown up and what they have to do. And they started to go through the list of the, the people in the nursing wing and they started to talk about Rose. And one nurse shook her head, yeah, Rose. And Rose was going to be the assignment of this nurse. And she was curious, when you shake your head, why do you shake your head about Rose? I said, well, we try to be very inclusive here. But every evening, early afternoon, late afternoon, early evening, we get to the dining hall and Rose throws a fit. And we really can't have her in the dining room throwing a fit. But we don't want her to eat in a room because, well, that's not very inclusive and it's not very kind. But we don't know what to do with her. So this young nurse asked, asked if she could look into Rose's background. And she did. She goes, we're missing something. Maybe it's not Rose at all. She has early onset dementia. At the end of the day, when she gets tired, well, she slips. And the nurse wanted to figure out when she slips or fades, right? Maybe back into her memory, what's still there. It takes her back to when she was younger. And the nurse found out when she was younger, Rose was the hostess at the family restaurant. And she'd been there for over 30 years. So in the afternoon, as she gets a little tired and maybe a little bit vermished, she starts to envision going into the dining halls, going back to the restaurant. And the nurse figured out that in the restaurant, you don't sit at the table and eat if you're the hostess. It's a cardinal sin. So the nurse asked her boss, can we make Rose the hostess of our dining hall? I'll get her a, a podium for the door and she can greet people and help seat them and get them napkins, coffee, and maybe an extra piece of pie for dessert. I think it'll help us, and I think it'll definitely help her. So the manager said, fine, good work. Let's see if this works. If it doesn't, we haven't lost anything. Well, it was phenomenally successful. Rose would greet people. She would help seat them, get them extra forks or knives, get them the pie they'd need or some refill on coffee. And then at the end of the evening, they cleared the dining hall, and they'd set a little table up in the back of it, and they'd bring a plate out with a silver warming cover because the nurse realized this is what Rose was used to back in the day in the, in the restaurant. So in the first night she tried it, Rose sat at the table and she put her hands over the warming tray and she said her prayers. And she ate, lifted the, the cover and she ate that meal and was not a problem in that, that room again. In fact, she was a blessing. It was because somebody took time to find out what her story was, what helped her get from birth to her senior years. Again, fools don't survive, but more importantly, we can learn from each other when we figure out how do you survive? And we do it through stories. We remember our stories and they uh, done well, are passed on from generation to generation. And uh, there's a benefit to that, that as well. I had a great uncle Max and as much as I preach listening and I teach listening and I try to make my living listening, he was, he was the pinnacle. He remembered things I was shocked. He would call me four weeks after our prior phone call and say, by the way, how was that meeting you had last night? You remember I had a meeting last night? I mentioned it in passing when we spoke a month ago. He goes, yeah, I know. I go, do you write this stuff down? He goes, no, I just care about you. So I remember what you tell me. As Max faded, he went from living on his own to a nursing home. And I went to find him. 
and there was a big room and there were three walls of people on chairs looking up at the TV screen and they were they weren't quite even there there was no attendant working with them nobody trying to help them just letting them be old and one day closer to their death and i couldn't find my uncle so the image of the people in the room was scary enough but then he wasn't there and i went to the front desk he said i'm, I'm ben marins uh, my my great uncle is here but i can't find him and they said what's his name so his name is max max phillips and one nurse looked and couldn't find him. The other nurse looked and couldn't find him. And then supervisor came over and said, oh, you mean 301B? I was so angry. And I took a deep breath and I said, please, don't you ever call him 301B again. His name is Max Phillips. He is uh, the father of Susan and Arthur Phillips, he was married. He served our country in World War II, and he served our streets afterwards as a postal worker who delivered our mail. He loved, and still does, loves a stiff drink at the end of the day, a scotch, if you will. And he used to smoke a lot of cigarettes when he quit cold turkey, by the way. He started chewing a pack of gum a day at least, so one habit for the other, but a healthier habit. He has almost no body fat on him. He loves a good meal. And most importantly, he's the best listener I know. His name is Max Phillips. He's earned the right to be called by his name. I don't know if they, he left there shortly after to a different place. Uh, so I never saw those nurses again, but I hope even though they saw that I was angry, they saw that I was right, that people have dignity. And our dignity comes from the stories that we have. Uh, my mother, Miriam Merrins, died back in 1989 from a brain tumor. She was only 57. So she was, she was pretty young. But it is the stories of her that keep her going. Uh, not necessarily her yard site or uh, how much money she earned, but it's the people who remember her who tell the stories of her. For our uh, tradition on her yard site, my younger brother and I, almost every year for 33 years now, and my older brother, some of them, would go to the cemetery on May 7th. We'd put a blanket down because May 7th, the ground is not generally too dry. And we'd spray her perfume on her tombstone. And she, uh, she's buried next to her mother and father and her twin sister. Uh, so we give them some perfume too. It's Bologna, by the way, people like to know. You spray her perfume and you smell the memories. So every year we spray the perfume on her grave and we tell stories about mom that sometimes each of us didn't know. So mom is kept alive because even though she passed in 1989, we're learning things about her life still, and it keeps her alive. My uh, folks divorced when I was six. In high school, I decided mom did as much fathering as dad. So I started to send mom a Father's Day card and dad a Father's Day card. We, uh, I did this for years and we never spoke about it. So junior year of college, I thought maybe I've upset her. And I don't want to offend my mom. I love, love mom. So I didn't send a card. And she called me a couple of weeks later and she said, uh, uh, why are you mad at me? I said, mad at you? Why would you think I'd be mad at you? She goes, well, you haven't, uh, you haven't sent me my card. I said, mom, you've never said anything about it. I, I just assumed you didn't like it or I offended you. She goes, Benny, I look forward to that card more than any other. And I thought, you know what? She was an identical twin. My mom and my aunt had the same cars when I grew up. When I came home from the hospital, I lived next door to each other in identical ranch houses. But I know one thing my aunt never got, and that was Father's Day cards. So I sent her those cards for the couple years I had left till she passed. I finished telling the story, and my brother's jaws were dropping. They couldn't believe the story because they'd never heard it. 
it was a good story, which led them to tell me stories. And hence the, uh, the art site is not just a chance to mourn, but it's to celebrate their lives by having stories. Norman and I are cousins on my dad's side. I was just talking to my wife the other day about the fact that we know so little about this side of the family. Uh, and I guess as we get older, the information is important. I wish I'd asked my dad more. Um, my grandfather tells a great story about a man on a train. I remember the brass, the outline of it, but I didn't write it down and I should have because it's a story I'd like to share with you if I only could. So what is a story? And you've listened to several of mine, thank you. A story is a series of moments, like a quilt. We put our pieces together. And you use your own creativity, which means in the history of the world, from the beginning to the end, there will never be a storyteller quite like you. And it is our unique qualities of being able to share that in part make us great storytellers. Two other tips that I offer are that, first of all, 99% of your story, we don't have time for, or we don't want, or you don't need to share. So when you tell a story, I ask people to consider what's your 1%? What's the most important part of that story you need to get out? I never tell the same story exactly the same way. As I said, I look at the stories I tell as pieces of a quilt. So uh, my, my mom had, was uh, 57, I told you that. She had a brain tumor. She died in 1989. There are other pieces of the story I didn't share. As long as I'm comfortable weaving them, that's where practice comes in. You get better at this by doing it. Even if you just record your stories onto your voice memo on your phone and listen to yourself, get comfortable with it and realize if you're enjoying the way you hear that story, I'm probably enjoying it. And if you're bored by it, <laughs> I would be bored by it too. What's your 1%? When journalism was developing through World War II, we developed the inverted pyramid. Tell me the who, what, where, when, why, and how. In the first paragraph, because the bombs may knock out the wires. And if the, uh, the most important story was that a, a bomb dropped and killed 300 kids in the school in Dresden, that would be the first sentence because you may not have a second sentence the way the fighting was going. Well, I apply the same principles to what we tell stories, right? There are many news stories, if you will. What is your who, what, where, when, why, and how? What do you feel you must tell me? And everything else, what could you tell me? Sprinkle some of that in and realize you won't get it all in. And the second thing, is where do you start your story? So when we talk about once upon a time, it's not just how we put our kids to sleep. Once upon a time is where every great story starts. And again, you can do it in many different ways. If I was to tell you a story with a once upon a time to grab you, I would say, my entire life changed when I felt the pop in my back. That's a quick painted picture that should get you leaning forward going, what happened? If that didn't accomplish that, then it's not the right once upon a time. And there's not one, there's many, but in this case, that would be one of them. So uh, there is a movie I like to talk about called Sliding Doors with a woman named Gwyneth Paltrow as the lead actor. She gets fired from her job to start the movie, puts her stuff in a box and goes out. She's in London, so she goes down to the tube. And on the way down the stairs, there's a little kid holding onto his mom's hand walking up. And the little kid jumps away from his mother and gets right in front of Gwyneth Paltrow who has to stop one moment. In that moment, the train has come into the station. And because she stops, she doesn't make the train. And then she waits 
for the next train. While this is going on, the apartment she lives in with her boyfriend is currently occupied by the boyfriend and his girlfriend. So because Gwyneth Paltrow misses this train, she doesn't get home in time to catch him. Then the movie says something really fascinating. It starts all over again. And this time, as Gwyneth Paltrow goes down the stairs, the little kid starts to pull away and the mom grabs his wrist and she makes the train. So she gets home and she finds the boyfriend in bed with the girlfriend. Now you've got a whole different storyline. The movie continues on dual tracks. On one tell, she made the train. On the other tell, she missed the train. And it made all the difference, one moment. And at the end, the movie comes together. If you've not seen it, I won't end it, ruin it for you. It's worth seeing. But it, it is a moment in time. And often we don't know what those moments are. But when we tell stories, we can identify moments that are critical as you're thinking about how to tell somebody your story. What do they need to know? There's a, uh, there was a show called West Wing. And uh, it was a liberally bent show about politics and life in the White House. And there are two characters, Leo and Josh. And Leo's job had been threatened. And now Josh's job is getting threatened. And Leo says to Josh, I've got your back. Don't worry. You're going to be okay. Josh goes, what do you mean? He goes, I want to tell you a story. A guy's walking down the beach and there's a huge hole. He doesn't see it. And he falls in and he cannot get out of the hole. And a preacher walks by and he says, Father, I'm stuck in the hole. Can you help me get out? And he writes a prayer on a piece of paper and he drops it into the hole. Well, it doesn't really help him, but I guess he feels a little better. And then a doctor walks by. He says, Doc, I'm stuck in the hole. Can you help me get out? And the doctor writes a prescription. He throws it down in the hole. Doesn't do much good. And then his friend Larry walks by. He goes, Larry, Larry, I'm stuck down here in this hole, man. Can you help me? And Larry jumps down into the hole. He goes, Larry, you fool. Why would you do that? Why would you jump down here? Now we're both stuck in the hole. He goes, yeah, I know. But I've been down here before and I know how to get out. <laughs> Our stories show us how to get out of the holes that we're in. They teach others what's possible because of what we bear witness to, what's happened in our lives. So one way to get us to your 1%, and this is where you're going to start doing a little work. So if you have a, a pen uh, and paper. So years ago, I met a guy named Larry Smith, and he had a magazine called Smith Magazine. And he started the Six Word Memoir Project, the most famous being For Sale Baby Shoes Never Worn. Now, I tell you this, and most of us hear that and shake our head thinking a baby died and it's a tragedy. And I think that's how the story goes, but I don't know if perhaps for sale baby shoes never worn were the shoes of a couple from Northern California who decided that their child shouldn't be uh, so bourgeois as to wear shoes. So they're going to sell the shoes and let the kid run around barefoot. I'd rather that's the story. I don't know. Larry Smith asked his readers to send him six word memoirs. Figured he'd get a couple dozen and publish some. Over the years, he's now published millions. And he's not only published books of six word memoirs, he'll have events where there'll be a theme. You write a six word memoir. And then you read your memoir. And then you explain your memoir. Building, excuse me, building from what is your 1%. So let's take a couple minutes to write a six word memoir. Some of us can share them if you want. Write a six word memoir that has to do with your Jewish family life from your childhood, from your present.
And it has to tell a story, but it doesn't have to necessarily be subject, verb, direct object. You have six words. And when you're done, I'd ask you if you would turn your video on just so I can see you. Um, and if you want to write them, you can speak them. Either way, we'll share them. Does anyone want more time? Okay. So while you're writing, if you're still writing, uh, Jacob or Nancy, do you want to read yours? What did I say? The store took precedence over Shabbos. Such a nice, clean sense. Are you a journalist, by the way? No. No. Just been writing some about my father recently. Well, it says so much. It says that there was a Jewish family because there's Shabbos. It, there's religious overtones in the family, but there's also business concerns. I don't know if the store took precedence over Shabbos every year. I don't know if they took precedence over Shabbos completely for 24 hours. But I want to know whose Shabbos was interrupted. What kind of store was it? Uh, was there a price, a penalty to this that you felt was ever paid? Uh, does the store still exist? Six words are really powerful. What kind of store? It's a hardware store. Our plumbing supplies. Still? Oh no, we closed it in 1982. What was it called? Medford Supply. We had a hardware supply store in my town called Winnikey's. You'd walk in and you'd feel the, the uh, wood sag. And there was always two old guys who worked there and they knew where everything was. <laughs> store took precedence of a show. Whose store was it? Well, my father opened it in 1935 on the last day of business in 1982 behind the filing cabinet. They found an uh, envelope with opening day flyers from 1935 <laughs> with original prices. <laughs> Just classic stuff. Marlene Herman, family, household, shul, celebrations, daily accountability. See, here I'm challenged more by the, almost trying to, can you say overwrite with six words? Because you're trying to get so much in there. Um, what were you thinking when you wrote that? What event was coming to mind? Oh, I was supposed to think of an event. I wasn't doing it. No, you're not. No. Not necessarily. I'm just wondering what what came to your mind when you saw that. Yeah, Marlene. Mm -hmm. You're muted. You're still muted. You can't unmute. There you go. Marlene? 
We're not hearing you. I don't know. How to end. Okay. So again, Marlene Road, family household shul, celebrations, daily accountability, and almost as a kitchen sink memoir. Um, I mean, there's more syllables than Jacob and Nancy's, but I'm not sure the picture was painted. When I was asking, what do you see? Um, because household celebrations, I always see my grandfather. I see the Seder table. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what you want me to know. If you only had six words, what would you want me to take away? And again, there's no right way to do this. There's, you could write 20 versions. The discipline, by the way, of six words are getting you to think about what your 1%. There's just so many people who have sort of monopolize our time because they won't be efficient with their words. And they'd be better off and so would we if they were taught to do this. Aaron writes, bris bar mitzvah chuppah. Bris bar mitzvah chuppah. I guess we're going to go with the, the dashes uh, to combine bar and mitzvah. Um, but yeah, you've painted a picture here. It's universal. And yet it's so individualistic for every one of us. And you did it with a minimum of words. I didn't get to hear you say it. Oh, I don't have enough. Huh? Bris bar mitzvah chuppah, bris bar mitzvah chuppah. Rinse okay. and repeat. See, it's funny you said that, but because I could see you too, had I not seen you, I would have said, I can hear you smile. So you were celebrating facially with those words, which would make sense. But that's why it's important. In, uh, when I started working in radio, Wisconsin Public Radio, I had a boss say, don't forget. And I'm watching you. You look like you're enjoying it, but you're not smiling. I go, so what? Who cares? It's not TV. He goes, your audience can hear your smile. And it's true. Nancy adds, sitting around outdoors together, laughing, eating. Are you in Wisconsin? No. No, we're in Massachusetts. And, oh, in Massachusetts. Not, it's not outdoor weather today, is it? No, I was thinking about circus. Oh, I thought it was circus. Okay. Where are you in Massachusetts? We're near Boston. We're in Arlington. Yeah. And it is outdoors weather today. It looks good. It's in the low 60s out today. Oh, it is. Our daughter's out in Boston. I haven't talked to her today. So. <laughs> so you think about circus where? Look us on our deck in the fall. How many years have you had the house? 1989. Uh, 32, I think. <laughs> a a circus every year? Every year. Well, I didn't get the sukkah finished the first year, but I had the pieces and finished, had it the next year. Okay. And who comes to the circus to celebrate? Well, there's family and there's friends. Um, it depends on the day. Uh, <laughs> certain people come on, for Friday night. Some people will, will come on, on Sunday. It depends. We try to get as many people as we can on different days. Okay. Remember me, you taught me to swim. Where's Mike Lirius? How many years ago was that, Michael? Uh, you actually, it? it happened last week. What did? A man approached me and said, remember me? You taught me to, how to swim. And how long ago had you taught him? Probably close to 25 years before. I had not seen him for 25 years. <laughs> Okay. And 
How did you react to this? Well, he tells me who he is. And he says, remember, I'm Francisco. I lived in unit number three, one of my buildings. And I know you can see here, but I go, but when I saw you, you were this high. <laughs> okay. Uh, it made my day. I bet it did. And uh, amongst other things, I taught the kid how to, uh, um, I dragged the kid into American youth soccer. Uh, I had a, um, a uh, ulterior motive. I, if he had parked his soccer, he couldn't be hanging around with the gangbangers in the building. And he said that even after he moved out, he continued playing soccer. And to finish up the story, he's now married with two kids and economically successful. Nice, nice work and a so, great story. Again, our, our lives are about the journeys we take and the people we meet along the way, the people who shape us and the people who we help shape. Some of them are older than we are. Some of them are younger. If we're teachers, they often are shaped by us in ways we never get to know. And they shape us in ways they never understand. So our sharing of stories essentially makes us teachers and students, all of us. The, uh, to me, the fun part about telling a story is knowing that I can look in the eyes of my audience and see I connected with you. Because we are trying to connect and find our way and, and realize we just don't know. So I mentioned my, my, uh, my mom, Miriam. My father, Robert, uh, lived many more years than mom did and was married three times. I was the best man at his third wedding. And uh, he died right before Christmas in 2012. And I remember we sat Shiva Christmas Eve and then the following week, I was back in Milwaukee. This was in Chicago. And I was greeting people at synagogue, and I was getting condolence hugs. And an older man walked up to me. He goes, I'd like to give you a kiss. And I looked at him, and I didn't really know how to react to it. This older guy, I didn't know who he was. And he smiled, and he opened his hand. And in it were several Hershey's kisses. And he said, you know... I used to be a women's sportswear wholesale rep, and this used to open a lot of doors. I sold a lot of clothes. And he kind of gave me a wink, and he walked away. Well, my dad had been a women's sportswear wholesale rep, and I hadn't heard the phrase in over 25 years because he retired. So I didn't know <laughs> how to take this, Except to think, well, if there's any way that we can give messages, and assume you get one, what's the only message a son, father would want to tell his son? I'd like to give you a kiss. Pretty good message. I'd probably want to give it to my daughter if I got one message. But I also, oh, those are the kind of stories you don't use, you share because people go, ah, you're a little crazy, and why would you think that? And so I didn't tell anybody about it. Two weeks later, my sister called. And she goes, Benny, the weirdest thing happened two weeks ago. You're going to think I'm crazy. I said, what happened? Alice was in bed, my six, at the time, six-year-old niece. And she started to scream. And I went upstairs to see what was going on. Uh, and she claimed Grandpa had been talking to her. And she said Grandpa's friends were teasing him about how long it took him to get to them. And it was Howie. And and buddy now she was six and these guys had died well before so she couldn't possibly know their names so my sister said is it really possible grand dad was talking to alice <laughs> i don't know but if this was last friday night i think he was in milwaukee about seven o'clock <laughs> So he may have stopped in Chicago an hour later. We have no way of knowing. And I'm not telling you that story because I believe that that's what happened. I'd like to think it happened. I don't know. I don't know why. Sometimes the stories are just about how wonderful life is because of the wonder. And it's the sharing of the stories that make it just 
worthwhile when things seem futile. The uh... <laughs> remember me, you taught me to swim. Our daughter's 26. When she was a couple weeks old, we had a, a gift certificates uh, to well baby, well mother. So basically it was like getting uh, a woman who'd come in for a couple hours, take care of your newborn so you could sleep, <laughs> which is essentially what happened. She also did some sewing of a blanket that we liked and helped us kind of get used to having a new life in the house. Five years later, we were at the Renaissance Fair at the local uh, uh, preserve, forest preserve over here at uh, Schlitz Audubon Nature Center. A woman walks up to us, she goes, is that Hope? Now, when it's a stranger and they know your child's name, you get pretty concerned right away. She goes, oh, I'm so-and-so. I was her nanny with well baby, well mother. Hope didn't share any words with her. And she didn't share a story except the first couple of days of her life. But even with just looking at somebody else, you can have an impact. Because in this case, you remember who this child was five years later and only knew her in the first couple of months of her life. I think that our stories give us the opportunity to get to know people uh, in, in ways that just sitting down to a cup of coffee doesn't necessarily do it. It opens us up and um, mm -hmm. I just, I can't stress the importance of figuring out the most important stories that you've got. Uh, I tell people at our ages, mom isn't here, grandma's not here. The people who knew everything about us at some point in our lives are gone. So the only way we know each other are by the stories of us we share to each other. And you only have so many stories, so much time to share so many stories. So it's really important you think about if it's seeing a friend for the weekend, calling a, a, a child or a, a relative or a friend, what's really important that you wanna share? Because the time is valuable and they're giving you their time to hear your story. So it's important to have a, have a purpose for it. But well, we're about time here. I, I'm glad I got the six word memoirs. Is there any questions anybody wants to ask? Or if you want to talk to me offline, we can do that too. But if you got anything you want to ask while we're here. Uh, ben, ben, could you uh, tell everyone your website for if they want to purchase the books? So. Oh, yeah. Um, if you want to contact me about anything, just my email is ben at benmarins.com. And my LinkedIn profile is pretty up to date. My website's a little old. So if you want to see what I'm up to at LinkedIn, if you want to contact me, um, I have an audio book. I do sell that. I do uh, training for anyone who wants uh, improv speech training, impromptu speech. So for people who do public speaking work or want to do theater work. Uh, and again, I'm looking to do more speaking work. So if you are part of other groups that would want to hear something like this, by all means, uh, pass my name on. And again, it's ben at benmarins.com. By the way, I've been doing research, or Michelle has, and sharing it with me. It was Marensky with a Y, Norwin. Yes. yes. I didn't know that. I thought yeah. it was with an I. No. no. And Tarnovsky before that. With with roots in Ukraine. Yes. All right. So. And uh, anyway. then, they, then they moved down to France from there. Yes. Yeah. We would have to talk because Michelle has questions. In any event, my email is simply ben at benmarins.com and you're welcome to email me if you want to talk individually to get in touch. But I appreciate your time and I wish you well and good luck in sharing the stories that you've got and getting stories from others. What's the one tip that you would give how to elicit without writing down people to tell their stories? You can't hear me? No, I can. Um, oh, I had a new microphone. I didn't know how to turn it on. It sounds great. Uh, Marlene. I, Thank you. I would let them know that you're interested. No, really, I want to hear your story. Because a lot of people think that nobody wants to hear it. The other thing that I do to let people know that their story is valuable to me, and this helps them recognize the value of my time, is I 
teach people to interrupt with intention. So if you interrupt me, proving you weren't listening to me, what's rude is your <laughs> inattention. But if you interrupt me to have me clarify something, at that point, your interruption with intention helps me tell the story, which makes your interruption purposeful. So it's saying to me, tell me the story about this, Ben. And then if I'm not focused to your question, help me get there. Those are the two things I think that are most important because they're letting people know the story is important and nothing lets me know you're listening more than when you question something I'm telling you because it tells me you're listening and not waiting for me to finish. Okay, we want to thank everyone for joining us. Yes. Uh, if, uh, as Ben mentioned, uh, you know of others that may have an interest in this presentation or other similar uh, topics, uh, please let us know. And uh, we wish you a pleasant Sunday and uh, look forward to joining on our next FJ FJMC program, which will be in April.